questions for reflection. Our first reading is from the Messianic Old Testament prophet Isaiah. The section we heard is from the beginning of the 49th chapter. The entire chapter addresses the servant of the Lord and his mission on behalf of the Lord. As Christians, we look back on these verses and see them fulfilled in the New Testament. Today, the Western Church, the Latin Rite, recalls the nativity of John the Baptizer. Except for the Lord himself and Mary, the mother of the Lord, John is the only New Testament saint whose birth and death we commemorate in the liturgical year. He was a forerunner, the one who would herald the coming of the Messiah. And as the prophet proclaims, he was called from the womb. In the ancient Christian prayer of the rosary, one of the mysteries we reflect upon is the visitation of Mary to her cousin Elizabeth. When Our Lady went to visit her kinswoman Elizabeth, she was carrying the incarnate word Jesus, and Elizabeth was carrying John. And the Gospel of Luke tells us, and I quote, When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the infant leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, cried out in a loud voice and said, Most blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how does this happen to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For at the moment the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the infant in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed are you who believed that what was spoken to you by the Lord would be fulfilled. And Mary said, My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. And that's Luke chapter 1. Living in his mother's womb, this last prophet of the Old Testament and first prophet of the New responded to the arrival of Jesus the Savior with a dance of joy. St. John records John the Baptizer explaining the reason for his joy in these words. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The best man who stands and listens for him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made complete. He must increase, I must decrease. That's John 1. 29 and 30. Children in the womb have a fundamental right to life. Life begins at conception. The prophet Isaiah makes that clear. Psalm 139, appointed for our response, does as well. You created my inmost self, knit me together in my mother's womb. Notice the exchange between Jesus and John. How do we treat children in the womb? What are we doing to end the intrinsic evil of abortion? In our second reading, taken from the Acts of the Apostles, we have another excerpt from the Apostle Paul's sermon in the synagogue in Antioch to the Jews. He persuasively presents the case that Jesus was the descendant of David promised throughout the prophets of Israel, and that John was his precursor, the one who prepared the way, the one who always pointed to Jesus. John still points to Jesus in both his birth and his martyr's death. That's why we celebrate both today. Two millennia after his illustrious mission as the harbinger of Christ, we readily accept, as we should, his prophetic role in the revelation of God's plan of salvation and the advent of the gospel. Yet how might we have seen John if we had been his contemporaries? Would we have so readily accepted him or might we have rejected him as a fanatic or extremist? Let's face it, John was peculiar. He dressed like a caveman, ate insects, and railed at politicians for their fornication and marital infidelity. He sequestered himself in the desert, where he tirelessly initiated converts, fleeing the sinful pollution of the cities. He proclaimed the end if the people failed to repent, and he used vivid and mystical imagery. In the popular media of the day, he was portrayed as a nut and a dangerous fanatic. By standing apart, boldly calling out evildoers without regard to their prestige or rank, by challenging his own co-religionist, John made himself terribly unpopular. At the end, he publicly and relentlessly criticized the personal behavior of the most powerful politician in Judea, Herod. And as a result, he was arrested and executed as a traitor. He was a man of faith-filled courage. Are we men and women of faith-filled courage? On June 24th, the Western Church celebrates the birth of John the Baptizer. On August 29th, we commemorate his death by beheading. Other than the Lord himself and his blessed mother Mary, 
John's the only saint for whom we celebrate both his birth and his death. Now, in a beautiful excerpt from a sermon of St. Augustine on John the Baptizer, that great bishop of Hippo calls us to pause and reflect on why we do this. And I quote, The Church observes the birth of John as in some way sacred, and you will not find any other of the great men of old whose birth we celebrate officially. We celebrate John's as we would celebrate Christ. This point cannot be passed over in silence, and if I may not perhaps be able to explain it in the way that such an important matter deserves, it is still worth thinking about it a little more deeply and fruitfully than usual. That was Augustine. Our image of John is as the austere ascetic, the odd fellow who lived in the desert eating an odd diet, thundering to Israel about repentance. We forget the joy the joy associated with his birth, and the happiness which accompanied his prophetic life and vocation. He always pointed the way to Jesus, and so must we in our own age. When we begin to really understand this, we will also comprehend the freedom he experienced in both life and death. He simply said yes to who he was born to be, and continually said yes to who he was called to become. And he's an example for each one of us. He did indeed prepare the way for each one of us. When Our Lady went to visit her kinswoman Elizabeth, she carrying the incarnate word and Elizabeth carrying John, the gospel tells us when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the infant leaped in her womb and Elizabeth filled with the Holy Spirit cried out in a loud voice and said, most blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how does this happen to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For at the moment the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the infant in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed are you who believe that what was spoken to you by the Lord would be fulfilled. And Mary said, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. That's Luke 1. Living in the first home of the whole human race, his mother's womb, this last prophet of the Old Testament and first prophet of the New responded to the arrival of Jesus the Savior with a dance of joy. St. John, the great theologian, records in his gospel where John the baptizer explained the reason for this joy. Let's listen to it again. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The best man who stands and listens for him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made complete. He must increase, I must decrease. John the baptizer was a man of joy because he was a man of true humility. He was a man who understood that life wasn't all about him. He emptied himself willingly and was thus able to reveal Jesus to others. He was the best man at the wedding. His humility opened a space within him for true joy to take root and set him free. John is a sign of contradiction for this age, which is drunk on self-worship and lost in narcissistic self-absorption. He points to the path of true freedom, living a lifestyle of self-emptying. He must increase, I must decrease. This leads to ongoing conversion, to becoming a new creation. John is a man to be imitated in both life and death. He shows us how we are called to empty ourselves of ourselves and point the people of our age to Jesus. How are we doing?